Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregerson. In this video, we're going to talk about the properties associated with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So in the past, we've already seen how to take some matrix A, calculate its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now we want to look at some special properties. Let's actually look at the list of properties we want to talk about. All right, so we have a list of these five properties that we're going to explore. The first one says that A is invertible, if and only if, and this is a symbol that means if and only if, 0 is not an eigenvalue. The next one tells us how to calculate eigenvalues for triangular matrices. The third one talks about the results of the characteristic equation, that it's an nth degree polynomial. The fourth one talks about eigenvectors from distinct eigenvalues. And the last one tells us that for each distinct eigenvalue, there must be at least one eigenvector. So we're going to go through these one at a time. We're not necessarily going to prove each one, but we're going to talk about each one. So let's look at the first one. The first one says that A is invertible if and only if 0 is not an eigenvalue. So what does it mean for 0 to be an eigenvalue? Well, we have our eigenvalue equation. We have AX equals lambda times X. So what this is really saying is that we can't have these two things. We can't have 0 being an eigenvalue and A being invertible. So what happens if we get both of these things? Well, if lambda equals 0, we'd be looking at this. And if A was invertible, then we could multiply both sides by A inverse, and we would essentially be left with this. So if lambda equals 0 and A is invertible, then the only solution to this equation would be x equals 0. And remember, we can't have eigenvectors that are equal to 0. We're looking specifically for non-zero values for x that satisfy that equation. So we can see that if 0 is an eigenvalue and A is invertible, that results in uh, only the trivial solution for that homogeneous equation. Now, the second one says the eigenvalues of a triangular matrix are the diagonal entries. Once again, let's look at a little example to maybe just explain why this statement makes sense. If we just grab some random 3 by 3 matrix, for instance, A equals 1, 2, 3, 0, 2, 4, and 0, 0, 3. Now, remember to find those eigenvalues, we are going to solve this characteristic equation. But with this matrix, we can see that when we subtract lambda i, all we're doing is just subtracting lambda on the diagonals. And we have to calculate this determinant and set that thing equal to 0. But because this matrix is upper triangular, we know the determinant is just the product of the diagonal entries. And because we can write that we write that determinant just as this product that's already factored. It's easy for us to see when is this thing equal to 0. It's 0 only when lambda equals 1, 2, or 3 in this case. And so we can see that even if this is a larger matrix, as general n by n, that if it's upper triangular, the determinant will be calculated just in this way, just by taking the product of those diagonal entries. So those values will be the roots. All right, let's look at the next one. All right, so let's look at the next one. It says for an n by n matrix, the characteristic equation is a nth degree polynomial whose roots are the eigenvalues. And we've really just looked at an example of that. So when we write this as a, when we look at an upper triangular matrix, we can really see that this determinant value is going to be the product of each of those diagonal entries. And each one of those are a monomial in lambda. So just looking at this characteristic equation, we can see that if we subtract lambda on the diagonals, we'll have one monomial in lambda for each diagonal entry. And there are n of them. So when we look at that product, we expect to get an nth degree polynomial. So we can kind of see that that one makes sense as well. Now let's look at the last two. These last two we're not going to justify so much, but really look at their implications, what these two properties really tell us. Number four says that eigenvectors from distinct eigenvalues are linearly independent. So as we, if we find our first eigenvalue, it's some number, and we find an eigenvector that's associated with it, and then later we go on to find our second eigenvalue and our second eigenvector, that because these two eigenvectors are coming from different eigenvalues, that those two vectors are going to be linearly independent. That's what this one's saying. Number five says that for each distinct eigenvalue, 
Once again, if this is lambda equals 1 and this is lambda equals 2, those are distinct and different numerical values. So for each distinct eigenvalue, there must be at least one eigenvector. And this one makes sense. To find that eigenvector, we're going to solve this homogeneous equation. We're going to find the non-trivial solutions to this. But we've chosen lambda specifically so that this matrix was not invertible to guarantee that there are non-trivial solutions. So there should be at least one eigenvector associated with every eigenvalue. Now, what are these two things telling us together? Well, the, together they're saying that if I have some matrix A, and once again, if I just write it out as some kind of random 3 by 3, in fact, if I were to write it like this diagonal matrix, I can certainly see what those eigenvalues are right away. I would have lambda equals 1, lambda equals 2, and lambda equals 3. So I can see right away my eigenvalues because this is a diagonal matrix. But because I have three distinct eigenvalues, that means the eigenvectors I would generate, whatever those eigenvectors are, they will be linearly independent. But if that's true, then I have three linearly independent vectors in R3, and that would tell me that these things are a basis for R3. So if I have distinct eigenvalues, then because of this property that says that they are linearly independent, I will know they will form this basis. So to summarize that statement, I can say that thus for some matrix A that is n by n, if there were n distinct eigenvalues, and that's our if statement, if there are n distinct eigenvalues, and they are not always true, but if there were, we could get n associate eigenvectors, and they would all be linearly independent, and then since n linearly independent vectors in Rn form a basis for Rn, this set of vectors, this set of eigenvectors, would be a basis for Rn. And we could call that an eigenbasis. And why is that important? Well, we've seen in the past that choosing a basis for a system can often make a certain problem easier. And what we're going to see in the future is that the eigenbasis oftentimes is the exact basis we need to make certain problems easier. So if we choose the eigenbasis and we recast our problem in terms of this special basis, our problem might simplify to a nice easy form. And so it's very useful for us to have eigenvectors that form a basis for Rn. And so we're going to look at when we can do that and when we can't do that um, in the future videos. But for now, that concludes this video of the properties of eigenpairs. Thank you.